Welcome to Let's Talk Business, where Square business owners share their stories, the biggest lessons they learned, and their plans for the future. I'm Elon Pesso, small business evangelist at Square and a former business owner. And today we're talking to Deanna Ramlett from Mudfire Studio and Gallery in Decatur, Georgia. Thank you so much for joining us, Deanna. Thank you. It's nice to be here. Great to have you. Can't wait to share more of your story. Um, and with that, let's talk business. First, can you give us a quick introduction? Um, we've had Mudfire since 2013. I have a 25 year history in the clay industry. I started out in supplies, equipment like kilns and wheels and the actual clay and chemicals you need to make the ceramic work. And through those relationships and having my own supply store, I met the owners of Mudfire that were looking for a 10 year exit strategy and magic happened. Incredible. Can you tell us a bit more about what the business is and, and what it does? Absolutely. We are a membership-based pottery studio. So think of it kind of like you would a gym. Uh, we have 57 open hours of access in a, in a week. So people can come in and make their own work. About a third of our members are side hustling, um, working to make and sell pieces external to a job. About a third are full-time makers, and about a third are here just for enjoyment. We have an additional offering in our gallery space. Um, our resident artists and our members make and sell work here on Slate. It also offers inspiration for those that are here making, and we offer a singular date night experience. If someone wants to come in, they've never experienced play before, and they just want to do it one time. That's so cool. I love that you're really covering all sides of it for the hobbyists for professionals and teaching and, and helping every step of the way. That's, that's such an incredible business and, and model and full service that y'all are providing. Really cool. Um, yeah. So what led you to make that shift into taking over this business? Um, yeah, that's what, a great question. Um, it was, uh, a little bit kind of actually the wrong place at the wrong time. Um, I was in the middle of a six year stint trying to run my own supply store. I discounted myself out of that business um, with a desire to be helping young makers. It was mostly motivated with a, oh, I can't afford to pay that right now. Can I have it for this? Can I take longer to pay? And I kind of knew, I did the math up front in our business plan that in year three, there would need to be a cash infusion or a dramatic shift and that just never happened. And so we made it to year six and in year six, uh, we met this couple that owned Mudfire and they wanted to retire and they very much wanted us to take over the space. And I very much was cash poor at the time and a group of Mudfire longtime members came together and formed a an advisory board to provide a down payment for us to take over the business. And it actually was the best thing because it allows us to be involved in the part of the process that I always wanted to be involved in the actual making, the actual helping makers succeed and far less of the retail side. I still can experience the supplies. We maintained our distributorship relationships with the companies that were supplying to us, which is great, but we were able to then focus in on what we really wanted to do, which is, help people make pot. Incredible. Yeah. It sounds like everything for better or worse all lined up at, at the same time. And I think that's something that a lot of folks can relate to. And especially it really speaks to you and your passion is that you tried so much in, in the teaching side that it ended up costing the business, which is mm. really unfortunate, but it's really, it, it shows how much you care and how much your drive is to help others. And it's really incredible that that ended up helping and members ended up giving back to you to, to get it set up. And, and now you get to give back even more. That's, that's so wonderful. Um, yeah, I'd love to dive into that journey of taking over that existing business. It has pros and cons, advantages and disadvantages. What was that decision-making process of like, okay, this is 100% the right move. And what was that experience of taking over something that already existed with a community that existed and, and shifting into being the, the owner? 
having had the experience of starting something from the ground up, taking over someone else's something is very different um, because there's a structure already in place. There's a team kind of already in place. The members were already in place. Uh, the space physically was already kind of in place. So it, it sort of became um, a meandering to-do list that we've actually just now in year 10 kind of checked off the last things on the list that we wanted to change. Um, upon entering the space, the former owners actually lived inside of the space. They had like a loft apartment. And uh, at week one, I tore that down and we created a uh, makerspace room for a business residency program. And we did that because I had graduated from college with a ceramic degree after a degree in nonverbal communication, uh, neither of which taught me how to run a business. And I knew that there needed to be fundamental education and things like accounting and paying your taxes and getting your sales tax ID and all of the things that they're not going over in art school that makers really need to know. And I wanted this to be a place that that could happen. So the very first week I tore the living space down. And then from there, we just started to make kind of slow incremental changes. Um, one of the first major hurdles that we faced was that our county actually commingled accidentally our landlord's account with ours as far as business licensure uh, was concerned. And then after taking over an existing business, which should have just been an easy transition in paperwork, it became getting a new CO, a certificate of occupation for those that have gone through that process. That can be a huge headache. A lot of changes had to be made as far as fire code and ADA door handles and things that the former owners had been grandfathered in on, we then had to shift and change. Additionally, one of the uh, board members that was involved at a higher capacity wanted to be bought out of the arrangement two months in. Um, they decided that running a pottery studio was hard <laughs> and immediately wanted out. So that was something as a fledgling, brand new takeover business owner, having recently come off a failure, um, troubleshooting and navigating, you know, with an attorney, the buyout agreement and all of that. Ultimately, again, a good thing because it left me with full control. But it was um, it was neat for Fanny Fart at the beginning, especially with just all of the newness of the studio in general. Um, as far as the processes and things like that were concerned, we just we just sat down and drafted a plan. What do we want to do in year one? How do we want to be able to increase membership space? When do we want to purchase new equipment? How are we going to change kind of institutional things like these are the glaze colors that we have, or these are the clay bodies that people were used to. And you kind of have to navigate through those relationships almost one at a time sometimes when you're taking over a business that's already there because those people are fixtures in the business at the beginning. And so a lot of that just took a lot of time. And, and this year we paid off our promissory note to the former owners. And so we're, we're in the clear and they want to sell us the building. So that's the next adventure, but it all just becomes one big to-do list. Yeah. That's a lot of things to have to do. It's, it's almost like starting from scratch in, in that you have to do a lot of those things, but yeah, right. you do get at least some of those advantages. Um, congrats on paying off the note. That's huge. It's, that's, it's a long journey to get there, but that's a major accomplishment. So you should definitely feel really proud of yourself. And, and that shift to next buying the building and having that as a milestone goal is, is fantastic. Um, we talked about some of the, the challenges that run into it. What have been some of the advantages of, of taking over an existing? The advantages for sure were that the system was already going and the customers were already here. Um, the system that Mudfire set up in uh, 2001 when it started was very, very different than what was available for pottery classes nationwide. And since then, Mudfire has become kind of a footprint for other businesses like ours because almost every institution um, dealing in ceramic education dealt with it from a class footprint, meaning that you signed up for your session of class, you attended your class time, and that was it. And what that leads to is sort of a, 
stymieing of your creativity and your ability to explore fully the medium and the material because you have to practice to get better at this. It's not something, there's very few people that walk in our door and are just like, I'm a natural at this and it's just going to happen. It is something that literally takes hours and hours and hours to practice. So the model that the former owners set up, they were um, coming from the marketing and executive side of the world. And in post 9-11 time, they said, this is a very fulfilling, um, we want to do more with our time. We want to do more with what we know. And so we want to create this pottery studio. And their vision for it was to have open free range access to education and time. And so we have an open footprint model, meaning that there's 57 hours a week that someone can come in and use the space and there's not restrictions on that. So if someone wants to camp out because they have a work from home day and they're able to take their meeting with their headphones, they can do that and they can make pots all day long. And what that leads to is people that tend to stay for a long time. They don't come get frustrated with the class, miss a few classes because their kid was sick or something was going on with work and then leave. Um, it allows them to kind of, we call them fam, mud fire fam, because there are some people that have been here for the entire duration of the 10 years that I've been here. And some people that are from before I was here that are still here. And then we add new people to the mix all the time. But it um, it definitely was a benefit to have that unique structure. I don't know that it would have occurred to me to do that because I'd always worked on the creative side of things. And probably didn't value that independent access as much as someone that was trying to cram it in around an existing work schedule like the former owners. And I think it was pretty genius. And now many, many places have a more open access footprint like we have. Um, they had decided not to ever do one-time classes. They made a decision that that isn't what they wanted the studio um, to be used for because they had a large section of the studio that was their private workspace. And that's another thing that we we shifted, but it's not um, it's something that was made possible with what they created because they created the wide open spaces. They created, you know, these big windows and the nice gallery and all of those physical spaces. And so it was easy to step in and just start going where having started my business there was so much up front, just talking to an architect, deciding a paint color, building the shelving, and just being able to turn the key, come in, and everything was here. The electrical was done, the water, you know, the plumbing, all of the the headache of all of that stuff. There was no startup. It was turnkey. Yeah, that, that really is such an advantage to have everything ready to go, and then you can bring in your expertise and, and your decisions and, and make it your own, but at least you have that foundation. And like you said, if the majority, if, if this audience is, is folks that do it for a long time and you have this group that's already there coming, then yeah, that just makes it so much easier to, to go with that and, and keep it running. Um, your, we're, we're talking about the way you're setting things up, the way you're running it your brand and your culture and your community are also so important. Um, and I think that's a really big part of how you've made it through and, and made it the last 10 years. Can you talk more about what that is, how you established it and how that's been working in general as a business, but especially in taking over an existing? Sure. Uh, the culture, there was quite a culture shift actually from the former ownership model to ours. And part of that was simply that because they came in with an existing network of friends and peers, everyone that starts a new business networks to their family and friends first. And so they had sort of a core of professionals. They tended to be older. They were, it was very white here. Um, it wasn't very diverse in age. It wasn't di very diverse in type of job, socioeconomic status. It wasn't very diverse in queerness because it was very much the same kind of person that would normally be able to afford to take a class at an art center, which is a specific demographic. And it's usually suburban. There's not usually many art centers inside of a city. And while we're not in the city of Atlanta being indicator, we're, we're inside of city limits. And so we have an urban population and a younger population, a population that may be still attending school and maybe working their first jobs. 
And so one of the things that we did to shift the culture was to be very um, public with our viewpoints. Our, we had diversity signage. We made gender neutral bathrooms. We allowed for sliding scale memberships. We invited in the resident artist and business resident programs. We dropped criteria for those. The former owners had preferred somebody to have collegiate level experience in ceramics. And while that would be great, it's, it, it limits it then to people who had the ability to go to a high school or college that had those things and not everyone has that. So we kind of dropped back the criteria to be, are you interested? Are you passionate? Do you care about community? Do you want to be here? Okay, great. And that made a huge difference. It didn't happen overnight. We definitely uh, faced our hurdles getting there and having people understand things like greetings being super important when someone walks into your business, asking them what you can help them with instead of, are you a member? And things that just were very nuanced and needed a lot of navigation happened gradually over time. And now I'm very proud of the memberships that we have, very diverse in age, very diverse in race, very diverse in all manner of identity and socioeconomic status. And I think we have honestly a lot more people that are um, trying to supplement income or make their own work than we originally had. There was no survey at that point, but just from the general conversation you have on the floor walking around and talking to people, I know that that has steadily increased over the past 10 years. Yeah, that's all so wonderful to hear. I mean, community is a, a big passion for us here at Square and Seller Community. So it's so great to hear that you've been making that shift. And like you said, making things more equitable and, and open for other people who want to start their own business and, and to enable more, more folks to do that. That's just so great. Um, how has that been not necessarily received from other members, but how has that helped and, and affected the growth of your business? We started out when we had the turnkey. I opened the door and Mudfire was mine. Um, there were 80 members. We now have 275. We have 21 in our, our resident artist and business resident programs. And we have a wait list of 1136. Wow. <laughs> um, we've been looking at secondary spaces for a long time. And part of our issue, my issue, my issue, an issue maybe I need to let go of is that I want the space to feel in the same as Mudfire feels. Um, Mudfire doesn't feel like an inaccessible space. We're in an industrial pocket. It doesn't feel like it's... Um, too fancy or cost prohibitive or the parking is bad or unavailable and assuming that you live in the neighborhood and that you can walk here it doesn't it's uh it's set up a list of criteria that my real estate agent is definitely not super thrilled with me about but i think that being really choosy about those things and um kind of basing our decisions a lot of times on those things and how much mudfire feels like a home people come in almost daily and say this is the space that i feel safe this is the space that i feel comfortable someone pulled me aside literally the day before yesterday when i was loading the kiln and said this is going to sound overly gushy mushy you know kind of wild but i just wanted to tell you that i've spent 10 years in the city trying to find a happy place and i haven't found it until i got here and so I think that I want to hold on to that. I want to hold really tight to that. And I'm just like, if we have a wait list for a while, we have a wait list for a while. Yeah, that's that really, like I said, again, just speaks so much to how much care you put into this, the building a space that you would want yourself and it's, it's working and it's paying off both in terms of feels and financially it's, that's really an incredible accomplishment. Um, We'll talk more about the finances in, in a minute. That wait list of a thousand people is, is just incredible. Have you found ways of being able to expand your capacity in order to both welcome in more people and also 
become more profitable and, and have more sales. We uh, last summer we added 50 new spaces uh, doing a small construction project in house. Um, I helped a team build new storage areas for clay and new shelving so that we were able to add 50 people. We also built out our what used to be just a one time class that was only for someone coming in for the very first time. We added advanced level classes that are continuing. So that people that are on the wait list can take those classes and be enjoying the space and having a little fun and starting their process of learning and not feel trapped like they have to do the beginning class over and over again. We added some hand building classes and some unique things there so that they have some things to access while they're waiting. And also just doing more housekeeping with our membership list. Like Back when I first took over, I was grateful for each and every 81 of those people, you know, and it was like, I would never be like, your credit card's coming up on an expiration date. I haven't seen you in a little while. Are you still using the space? Now I feel more comfortable to have those interactions. Sometimes people want to hold on to the space because they really want to have the dream in their mind. I will get into the studio. I will make some pots. And at the beginning, like holding on to that, a little bit of that scarcity mindset from the failure of the first business, but also just that there were only 80 members. I never would have encouraged someone who wasn't using the space to free up that space for someone else. And now we we actively have those conversations. And I say, hey, if you want to come back, we'll skip you ahead on the membership wait list. But let's let this spot go to somebody who can actively use and engage with the space right now. Um, over the years, we've been able to expand our equipment, our wheels and our kilns and to keep up with the growth in membership. So we're able to service the capacity that we have. Uh, we've been talking about expanding the physical space, but we are bracketed. I'm sure you've heard a little bit of the road. We're bracketed by a railroad track, a road and a MARTA line, which is our public transit in Atlanta. So our variances would definitely be a fight with the city to be able to add on to the building and I, the only way we could go is up, which isn't super conducive for hauling heavy materials and stairs and heavy boards, heavy clay. Not so great, but we've been able to keep people happy with those extended offering classes because they can come in and get a feel for whether or not they actually want to be involved in a process of making or if it's not for them. Totally. That's that's such a great evolution of a business because immediately came to mind is the gym membership model where they want people to sign up and not show up. And here you are past that point and, and you're in the phase of you want people to experience it. And that matters more than just that income. So that's, yeah, that's, that's just a really incredible shift and incredible evolution. And so great that you're taking that approach because some other business owners might be, you know what, let them, let them go, but you want more people. You want that experience. And that, that first thing that you said of you did a construction project to add more storage for the members, uh, creations art pots. Um, and that enabled you to expand membership by 50 people. That's such a really like smart and insightful way to be able to grow your business without having to expand in, in space. You're expanding in, in storage and you're looking at what those limitations are. And that's, that's really incredible. Um, I'd love to dive a little into, uh, yeah, the, the other things that you've done to make it more profitable, whether it's other business decisions or tools and systems that you've brought in, how has that journey come around to, to becoming profitable and, and be able to pay things off. Absolutely. Uh, it's sometimes it's just taking advantage of little things, biting off small chunks. Uh, we've been talking in the sellers community uh, related to the book club, some things that people are doing to cut expenses. And some of it is things like that. Uh, we took advantage of the Georgia LED light program, for example. And we paid $600 to change the ballast of the fluorescent light bulbs that were all throughout the studio to LED ballasts and LED bulbs. And it paid for itself in two months completely. And the electrical for the lights used to be $31 a day just to flip the light switches on. And now it's 
it not only paid for itself, but our bills in general are less because that isn't happening anymore. So our electric bill went down. It's cooler in here, which kept the HVAC down because the incandescent light bulbs, especially in the gallery, were hot. I don't know if you've ever been in a gallery space, but if you stand under those lights, they're hot. And so replacing those with LED kept the HVAC down. Last year, we bit off a bigger chunk in re-roofing and insulation. We did a TPO roof with the extended insulation, and so that's been saving a lot on the energy bills. We didn't even have to turn on the heater a couple of months this winter because it was insulated enough. And with people in here and moving around, it just, we didn't even need to. And then it wasn't the case before. This is an old 1960s era building. It has, you know, drafty windows. It has uh, the concrete floor and it can be a, a little bit of a suck energetically speaking. But when the architect looked and reviewed our bill, he said, that is so close to the bill for my house. The bill for the front studio spaces went down with all of those uh, additions to what literally was about $100 more than his house. And our kennel room is another story. There's nothing I can do about that. <laughs> but <laughs> that's that's that. We started, um, after I read the Profit First book, we started putting away Profit. I had come from sometimes believing that profit was bad. If, if you had profit at all, then you didn't invest enough back into the business. You didn't change enough. You weren't doing enough. It wasn't good enough. And it was hard to just be like, no, there needs to be this little nest egg that's going to be for the future. And the future in our case is buying the building. The owner definitely wants to sell it to us. We are on our way. I have 50% of the deposit already. And we take a little more away every month. And that's what allowed us to do things like the roofing and those kinds of programs. But as far as shifting to change profitability, I think the major shifts were just having teams that were more engaged with the membership base. And that led to the positive word of mouth, having people all here learning at the same time. I think dropping those requirements and having the staff be kind of learning alongside with the members was really helpful because it did really form a community of people that were learning together and on the same path. And that dramatically started to shift the amount of members that we had. We started at that 80. By the end of the first year, we had gotten up to the capacity at the time, which was, again, more of an organizational problem that the former owners had set up, but our capacity at the time was 170. And so by the end of year three, I had added spots to get it to be 200. And then we kind of ran with the 200 thinking, I don't know, can this work? Do we need, like, how, how would this space look? And one of the first things we did was so strange. I cut a foot off the tables. And it sounds kind of wild, like, well, why would that matter? Why would it matter if you're looking across the room for the tables to be a foot shorter? But it did because it completely opened the space and allowed people to see each other. And once they were, the space was more open and it allowed them to see each other because you're sitting over a wheel and you're sitting on a stool that's about 18 inches high. So if your work table is in your eye line and you can't see across the space, it feels really crowded. But when we dropped the height of the table, it felt really open and no one, we did the project of building over the weekend. The members did not notice and added 50 spots. They came in and said, you painted something. And really, we extended the footprint of the shelving by two feet. And because I cut the tables down, no one noticed. And so it was just, it's, I think this is a lesson for business owners that sometimes it really is something that's just almost imperceptibly small that can make a huge difference. And the for us, adding 50 people, that's $155 a person a month. And we did it over a weekend and that, and then that money was able to start coming in and become the new nest egg bunny. So yeah, sometimes it's just small, small things. It's incredible. Yeah. A weekend and a hacksaw and you yeah. <laughs> increased by 25%. <laughs> That's incredible. I, I really see that as a big theme in everything you've been talking about is making these small changes that you wouldn't think have such a big effect, but really do from like you said, the way you're you're greeting your members when they walk in the door with dropping some requirements to little inclusivity things 
to adding more storage to increase but all all of this is really at the light bulbs that you're saving not only electricity but then hvac which i'm sure hvac is so important to pottery um and and the right temperature control like all of these little things are making such a big difference and saving money bringing in more money creating a better experience that's such a a big lesson to learn and and just incredible that it's had that effect um what's with with that what's the plan for the future where where do you see yourselves going uh you mentioned potentially second location what other growth or stability do you do you see right now we're navigating uh there's been a major shift in independent contractor law this year and Prior to now, we had mostly independent contractors because they were making their own schedules to teach those classes and doing so in a very not managed by us kind of way. And now the new law would require them to have their own business license. It would require them to have their own equipment to be able to do that. And they can't afford to do that and they can't afford to go through those processes. So Daphne and I are transitioning over to a W-2 structure, which is a little bit more financially impactful for us, but I feel safe to do that at this point because we have, we've increased our, um, when we walked in the door, the, um, the amount of money that Mudfire was making, we're now six times that. And so we, we've built the comfort to save for buying the building to save for any future expansion projects and to navigate this employment shift. I am looking at a space very close by to our current space, which at first seemed counterintuitive, right? Like, shouldn't I go in a different pocket of the city uh, further away from us? But as many square sellers know, Daphne had a very serious health situation last year and it got us thinking like, does this kind of hub and spoke model that we're thinking about actually serve us the best or would it serve us the best to allow a growth opportunity for a lot of the people that are here and they're in membership and they kind of need their own studio space, but arguably maybe don't want one in their home. A lot of times people approach ceramics and they say, well, it would be super easy just to have this equipment in my house, but there's a lot of associated, um, electrical problems the the equipment draws a lot of energy um it requires an electrician that knows what they're doing and is very much understanding that this piece of equipment is getting over 2000 degrees and the wiring distance becomes very important the available wiring in the box that you have at your house becomes very important and so we started thinking a couple of months ago what if we had like a pro studio space a space that was still a little bit managed by us in that we were going to provide access to the equipment. We still have the distributor relationships for the materials and that kind of thing, but maybe they have some more independence. They can mix their own glazes. They can load and fire their own kilns, but it's in a safe environment. It's the next level up for the people that maybe have been members for a long time and are, and are wanting to have a little more private space or for people that are in your business residency program and are RA program because they need somewhere to grow and spread their wings as they get their businesses to the opening stages themselves. And it would give them a space that they could have pop-up sales and have their future. So maybe it doesn't need to be that I'm duplicating the same experience and doing this over again in an another part of the city and, and having exactly this thing Maybe it's okay that I don't do that. Maybe it's okay that we just have this new pro offering. So that's kind of what we're looking at right now is would that be feasible? Uh, the second option we're looking at right now is could we split off the date night experience entirely? Could there be a space that was just, um, we're seeing a, a trend on social media of a lot of maker type spaces, carpets and candles and terrariums and things where it's an encapsulated space they may be able to serve drinks there. They can have, you can have a seating area. You can have some arcade games while people are waiting. You do the class and the class is kept more separate from the membership. And so for us, that would mean that we could expand membership a little bit more here and have the date night space be completely separate. So right now we're, we're looking at spaces that are actually closer to us instead of further from us. 
um, so that we can kind of feel out those two situations and see what works with that. Yeah, those are such really clever ways to be able to expand. And like you said, rather than just duplicating the whole thing, which could be a challenge anyway with that culture, this way you're doing one option as like the grad school equivalent of of that or right. the the more introductory those those are really cool i i love it best of luck rooting for you <laughs> um with with that that's basically all i have do you have anything else that you've learned along the way that you want to share for for other business owners listening and watching i think that the thing that i heard a lot when we were starting up and from now there's a train <laughs> the thing i heard a lot and when we were going through like our first business, I did the traditional um, score mentorship and did I just do something. We're, we're still good. I'm still here. I did the initial classes with score and we went in and we talked to business advisors and in talking to bankers and traditional finance type individuals, um, things felt very much like you had to be thinking in the big all the time big big thinking broad um and you do you do have to do that as a business owner but i think our biggest successes have been when we're thinking really small <laughs> and like you said earlier those little light bulb things it really did make more of a difference to the business to change the way we greeted people than it would have for any number of other financial decisions like which clay company i'm ordering our materials from am i saving a few dollars here or not and I do have to pay attention to those those bigger um, supply chain kind of things as well. But I think it's important to remember a lot of times that if you're in a public business where we really are dealing with very small things and it's those personal moments, I, you know, a lot of business owners are kind of behind a wall. They are in an office. They may not even be on site. Um, they may work remotely. They may not be there. And I think something that what I was acutely and painfully aware of during Daphne's hospital stay was that being here on site is really important to the people that they interact with on the daily because I'm having conversations with them about something they're intimately tied to. They're making something with their hands and I'm here with them to be part of that process. And it's very different than I could sit in the office all day long and run better numbers, but if I don't go outside and load and unload the kilns and have those interactions, I don't know that we would be here with this 1100 person wait list because that's what's making this work is that I'm modeling for my team what I want those interactions to be like and I'm on the floor doing it with them. And I think that makes a huge difference. Absolutely. Just just incredible of yeah that presence that you have that connection that you have and like you said it, it models that behavior for your employees it models that behavior for your members and it, it just really creates that space that you want and that's just just so wonderful this has been so great thank you so much again for joining and, and sharing your experiences and all of the insights and, and knowledge that you've gained over the 10 years of Mudfire and and beyond. It's it's really just fantastic to, to hear from you and, and learn so much from you. Thank you. Um, where can people find you online? www.mudfire.com. Our Instagram is also just Mudfire. Perfect. Thank you so much again, and we'll see you in the community. Thank you.